Thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it. My name is Mike Amender. I'm a, an experimental psychologist at Valve. Um, I get to do a, a ton of different things there, but one thing I focus on is uh, hardware research or alternative hardware research, looking into kind of um, input devices that might be around in the future. Um, and so the purpose of the talk today is to kind of give you guys, um, at least share our thoughts on how we think biofeedback might be useful um, going forward on this, you know, provide or at least creating compelling new experiences um, for players. Um, I'm going to be coming in uh, kind of hot on this talk. I do apologize. There's a lot of material I want to cover. Um, so I might be speaking a little bit quickly because I do want to get through it all, but I promise to, to stay and answer any question you guys have. Um, all right, so let's get to it. Um, so this will be a talk about biofeedback and gameplay and how Valve is using physiology to hopefully uh, enhance gaming experience. Um, goals of this presentation, um, hopefully you know, I'll give you guys an overview of what biofeedback is. Um, we'll walk through potential applications. Um, I'll show you some examples of things that we're doing at Valve. Um, I'll discuss the, the different physiological measurement techniques you can use um, in, in biofeedback testing, um, walk through some of the pros and cons, and then, I guess, interspersed throughout the talk, um, we'll, I guess, you know, I'll try and put in nuggets of kind of where we think um, this technology can be taken in the future, um, what we think is possible with it. Um, so let's start off by defining biofeedback. Um, this is my definition. Um, it's not really grammatically correct, but um, essentially um, I wanted to kind of, I guess, give you a clear picture of what's possible and what we mean by biofeedback. And essentially it's the measurement, display, analysis, modification, manipulation, and response to physiological signals. And what we're doing is recording biological signals from the body, um, performing analysis on them, displaying them, and presenting them back to the user um, in the hopes of kind of eliciting a response. Um, and the analysis part is actually a way of kind of quantifying um, player sentiment or emotion. Um, so it's a way of detecting signals from the body and saying, you know, this person's feeling frustrated or happy or aroused or sad or angry and so forth. Um, um, one, I guess, one, I guess, uh, thing to think about um, in terms when you're when you're doing this sort of research is that there is a feedback loop possible where signals you detect from people or from users or from players um, have a feedback loop where, um, you know, if you're recording someone's heartbeat and you're displaying it to them and they see their heartbeat in real time, they see they're getting more aroused, they might, you know, that might induce, like, you know, a further increase in arousal. So you get kind of a feedback loop um, where subsequent signals depend on prior states um, or, you know, prior emotional states. And one thing to keep in mind beyond that is that when we talk about emotion, um, people are not stable, emotions are not stable, they're transient, they're volatile, and they're subject to manipulation. Um, so, you know, we can record emotion in real time, but it doesn't necessarily mean that because someone's feeling aroused now, they're going to be aroused five seconds from now, or a minute from now, or an hour from now, and so forth. And so, um, you know, it gets a little tricky when you're kind of doing analysis, at least, you know, post hoc, um, on, on physiological signals. Um, I guess it's, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, you're looking at beat to beat um, measurements of emotion or arousal of physiological signals, and it's not necessarily something that could be stable or could be long term. Uh, just a, a visualization of kind of, you know, the biofeedback loop where you start with a, a physical, no more laser pointer. You start, if you start at the top of the, the, uh, the loop, you can see we start with a physiological response. Um, it provides an input to a system. Um, the system can perform analysis on that, creates a response, outputs that back to the player, which can induce a further physiological response. So this is the feedback loop I was talking about in terms of um, biofeedback uh, mechanics. So why are we interested in biofeedback? Um, what's so great about it? Well, if you think about current control schemes, um, so you know, your mouse and your keyboard, your gamepad, and so forth, um, they provide one dimension of input. And by, by one dimension, what I mean is that they're mapping player intent to on-screen action. Um, so, you know, the player wants to fire a gun, he presses the B button. Um, the player wants to accelerate their car, they hold down the right trigger. Things like that. You're mapping player intent to an on-screen action. Um, what you don't get with current control schemes, at least at the moment, um, you know, are other aspects of uh, cognition, you know, maybe long-term planning. You might not know what the player is planning to do, you know, five minutes from now, what the long-term strategy is. Um, and you're, you're also, you know, most likely ignoring player sentiment. How is the player feeling? Um, so there are, there are other aspects of gameplay, or at least the player's experience, that are not visible um, through current control schemes. And so we'd like to attack that problem. We'd like to see if, you know, investigating... Um, you know, these other axes of, of input, whether it's other aspects of cognition or player sentiment, and see if we can create better gameplay experiences because of it. Um, so here's just a silly little metaphor where, you know, you mapping player intent um, to traditional control schemes, and you get kind of a fuzzy picture of the player's experience. Um, and you, you'll see here I have the, you know, gamepad and a mouse and a keyboard. I don't have, like, Kinect and Wiimote and Sixth Sense and Sony Move style devices um, up there. Um, I'm going to ignore the kind of the natural user interface devices in this talk, um, not because we don't think they have potential and not because they can't be used for biofeedback type, um, I guess, measurements, but right now um, they're commonly used for, again, mapping 
player intent, you know, you're swinging a baseball bat, um, you know, you're waggling the Wiimote or whatever, to, you know, you're mapping player intent again to on-screen action, um, and not, they're not used as much for biofeedback. And also because I wanted to make this more of a future-facing talk. Um, I wanted to talk about less common technologies and not mass market devices that are available now. Um, so it's kind of like, well, you know, what's going to be possible in the future? Um, so again, I'm not ignoring them because we don't think they're valuable, but just because we wanted to make this more future-facing. So again, you know, why about feedback? I've been kind of touching on this, but we, we think that adding player sentiment into the equation will create better gameplay experiences. Um, it's a new and it's, it's been, you know, mostly ignored um, dimension of the player's experience um, in, 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 you know, most games and pretty much all games. And so we think it's possible if you add this component into the gameplay experience, you can create, you know, it's a, you know, kind of a stock sentence, but it's true, we think. You can create more immersive dynamic and calibrated game experiences. Um, you can adapt the gameplay or the game to how the player is feeling at a given point in time and hopefully create a better experience because of it. Um, so we go back to my silly little metaphor. You can see I like using, you know, Windows clip art or PowerPoint clip art. Um, but we're wrapping player sentiment, um, you know, to traditional controllers. You see a fuzzy picture of the player's experience. You add in, you know, physical signals and if it gets better, right? At least we hope it does. Um, you know, if, if, you know, if it doesn't, that's fine and hopefully we'll learn something along the way. But we think that we can create a better gameplay experience if we add in, um, kind of notions of, of arousal or, um, emotion or whatnot. So let's get to, like, let's actually walk through, like, you know, how we kind of do this sort of research. So we need to define emotion, right? If we want to measure player emotion, we need to define it. Um, again, this is my definition. Um, you know, it can be fuzzy. That's fine. Um, but I view it as a subjective internal state um, induced by a response to external events, um, you know, at least for the purposes of kind of this research. Um, and if you want to think about ways in which you could analyze emotion, you can think of it as a vector. So the vector has a magnitude and a direction, right? In this case, the magnitude of the, of the emotion vector is arousal. So how strong is it? And the direction uh, of the emotion vector is the valence. So the positivity or negativity. Is it a positive emotion or a negative emotion? And just with those two components, um, you can create, um, you know, you can get kind of a nice feel for where, how you can map different emotions onto this axis. So if you look at the, uh, the y-axis, you can see arousal going from negative to, to positive. X-axis is valence going from negative to positive. And so you can see, well, if someone's, you know, kind of at a medium level of arousal and really, really, and it's really, really positive, well, they're happy, right? If they're uh, kind of not really aroused at all uh, and, you know, it's somewhat negative, they might be fatigued. You know, if they're really negatively aroused, or sorry, really highly aroused and it's a really negative emotion, they might be angry. So if you can, if you can measure valence, so positivity or negativity, and you can measure emotion, you can do quite a, or sorry, you can measure arousal, you can do quite a lot um, in terms of actually, you know, ascertaining what the player is feeling, what emotions are feeling, whether it's, you know, jubilance or, you know, being happy, content, relaxed, engaged, bored, fatigued, and so forth. So the physiological signals I'll walk through, and again, there are lots more that I'm not going to talk about today, um, but here are five, of, you know, five common ones, um, heart rate, um, SCL, which is your skin conductance level, um, it's essentially, you know, how much energy your pH content of your sweat changes and you can conduct more uh, current through your, through your skin at any point in time, it's correlated with arousal. Um, it's the same thing as GSR, galvanic skin response, so those two terms are interchangeable. Uh, facial expressions, eye movements, EEGs, um, and then I'll, yeah, I'll mention that, you know, there are, like, you know, you can look at pupil dilation, body temperature, posture, and so forth, um, but I'm only going to really talk about the first five. So let's start with heart rate. Um, it's a beat-to-beat -beat interval of blood flow. Um, basically, you know, what you, you, you get a measure index of arousal here. Um, you can measure baseline rates and changes over time. Um, and there's some research that indicates you can actually um, deconvolve the components of the heartbeat waveform and actually get... Um, you know, more complex emotions, like maybe engagement or boredom and whatnot. So, like, I have the, the diagram on the right is the, the P, well, the QRS complex. It's, it's kind of the, the main spike of the waveform, and there are various ratios involved there that people think if you look at kind of um, the patterns of, you know, the patterns of the QRS complex in various folks that you can actually get more complex emotions beyond just arousal. Um, but it's a little bit hazy, um, but I wanted to mention it because it is a potential possible, well, it is a possibility. Um, for, for each uh, metric, I'll have kind of a pros and cons slide just so you can get kind of like a quick summary of, you know, the, what's good and what's bad about these things. Um, heart rate is, you know, it's get a great index of arousal, um, very cheap to do, um, very common. People are familiar with it, very easy to measure. Um, and you can you possibly, you know, do some, you know, advanced math to get valence with it. Um, problems with it is that it's prone to movement artifacts. Um, I actually I had to cut a slide of a mouse we made that had a heartbeat. Uh, we actually had a heartbeat mouse where you could had a blood volume sensor and you could detect heartbeat um, just by like having your hand on the mouse, but we get movement artifacts um, because of that. And so you kind of need to find a stable place on the body to measure heart rate. Otherwise, you're going to add noise. Uh, 
into the equation. Um, you also get a, a delayed onset to stimuli. So you don't actually know what events are eliciting um, increases in arousal necessarily because heartbeat increases, you know, increases gradually. I mean, you can get that pulse pounding effect sometimes, but um, still, you know, heartbeat, especially compared to other metrics, um, has kind of a, a longer lead time. Um, and then again, it's, you know, I said you could possibly do the math to get valence, but right now it's really difficult to determine, you know, if it's a positive or negative emotion. That you just know that someone's aroused. Uh, SCL, again, skin conductance level. Um, this is measuring the electrical resistance of the skin. Um, basically, it could be you're sweating more, but it's actually the pH content of your sweat changes. Um, you can conduct more current through your skin. Um, and what you get is um, the, essentially the, 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 more, the more, I guess, current you can conduct is very highly correlated with arousal. So you get a, a waveform of arousal over time, which is actually pretty useful. And probably the, the coolest aspect of, of SCL is that you get spikes um, that you usually have a lag time about one to three seconds, maybe two to five seconds, depending on who you talk to. Um, in response to eliciting events. So if someone, you know, if I, someone is having their SEL measured, I come up behind them and, like, startle them, um, you'll see a spike, like, in arousal, like, one or two seconds later in the waveform, which is pretty cool. Um, so you get kind of, you know, almost instantaneous um, responses. Pros and cons of SEL, so, it's, you know, great index of arousal, um, tonic and phasic responses. So tonic just refers to the overall level of arousal over time. So, like, heartbeat, it gradually, you know, you can gradually, you can tell generally where folks are being are highly aroused or not. Um, and you get the phasic responses, which are the spikes. Um, so these just kind of transient little, little, little blips in arousal that, you know, we could actually make, you know, do cool things with in gameplay. Um, so again, minimal lag of stimuli, um, very cheap, um, very robust to movement. Um, you know, you can, it's, we actually have a mouse that, you know, you can, the sensors are located on the palm and it, it works pretty well. People can move around. It's not a problem. And you can measure in a lot of different places. Um, you know, we're focusing on easy to use devices that are kind of tied to the hands, but you know, you could, you know, measure up by the mastoid process. You could actually do heartbeat here, actually, if you had a headset and, and had a clip here. Um, but yeah, it, it's pretty robust and, um, pretty intuitive, I guess, or at least pretty easy, uh, to use. Um, one problem, although again, you, you can get the spikes, um, because it is a waveform or because it can be noisy, it can be difficult sometimes to associate a listening events, especially if you have multiple events in combination. If you're playing an action game, um, it can be difficult to determine which event, um, actually caused the spike if a lot is going on. Um, again, difficult to determine valence, um, you know, it requires interpretation, um, which is not something that we want to do necessarily, but it's something that, uh, Oh, we we kind of have to because we, we don't really get valence, we only get arousal. And one other interesting, I guess, concern with SCL is the range is variable across subjects. Um, so you can get people who go from, you know, essentially it's one microsemen to like two. You know, they could be really highly aroused and that someone else could go from like two microsemens at baseline to like 15. And so is that the same thing? Like, you know, is that two to 15 range equivalent to a one to two range? And how do you map, um, you know, the subjective feeling of arousal that someone is feeling um, to those ranges. So it's something to think about is that the range is a lot variable, whereas, you know, in heartbeat, you know, people, typical resting heartbeats, you know, fall in, the, you know, the, the 50 to 80 range, and, you know, you can kind of compute maximum heartbeat based upon, um, you know, age and gender and so forth. But with SCL, it's a little bit trickier. So facial expressions, um, you know, this is just recording movement of the facial expressions, or, or sorry, facial muscles. Um, it really good at classifying emotion. Um, you can get both valence and arousal um, pretty well um, by recording someone's face. Um, you can do this remotely with cameras and have you know people code after the fact. There are companies that are starting to try and automate this process, which would be amazing. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to evaluate them here in this talk, but it's definitely something that people are thinking about. Um, you can also do it intrusively via EMG, which is electromyography. Essentially, it's just putting sensors on various facial muscles and you can measure how much they contract and you can actually, you know, you get, um, you know, really good measurements of what someone is feeling at any given point in time. Um, so again, um, you know, the work on facial expressions has been kind of around for a really long time. It, it, it's well established and so, you know, here, this you know, example, you know, famous six, uh, uh, I guess, canonical um, human emotions, you know, anger, surprise, disgust, sadness happiness and fear, and so you can detect all of these um, pretty readily, and you can detect the magnitude of these pretty readily um, by recording facial expressions. Um, so the pros and cons, you know, it's great index of valence, great index of arousal, so you get the full picture of emotion, um, and you get this instantaneously. Um, you know, people, you know, your faces will respond involuntarily. I'm really bad at it. I can't hide my emotions even as much as I try, and so I will respond really quickly. And it, it's, you know, it's, it can be frustrating, but again, it, you know, at least in terms of, like, its potential applicability to, uh, you know, as, a, as an input um, to gameplay, you know, having this instantaneous response is pretty cool. Um, people will respond almost automatically um, to various things. 
Um, the, the downsides, you know, definitely be intrusive, you know, if you know, people don't like having a camera on them or if, you know, you actually have the sensors on you, it's, you know, crazy intrusive. Um, it's expensive at the moment um, through this, both in terms of time and, and money. Um, again, people are working on kind of, you know, bringing this down to, uh, you know, automation through, through webcam, but we're, we're kind of not there yet. And processing, you know, requires a lot, you know, if you have a human coder who's watching people and categorizing, that can take a while. Um, and, and if you know, it is a human coder, they can be subject to bias, and then they also require training. But if you're requiring on some kind of, or if you're depending on some kind of automated system, um, it's a black box, right? Like we'd like to kind of validate um, these techniques ourselves with SCL and Heartbeat. It's a lot easier to do that with um, kind of you know software that's evaluating um, folks um, out of our hands. We don't like that actually, so that's kind of a, a personal preference. But we want to kind of validate these things in house, and so you do have to get, kind of depend on um, external algorithms to to make determinations. And so it's up to you as to kind of how valid that ends up being. But I mean, just in terms of the potential applicability, facial expressions are, you know, have a lot of promise. Uh, fourth one is, so eye movements. Um, basically, you know, we're just tracking where people are looking in real time. Um, so, you, you know, you can use remote or, you know, head-mounted cameras to, to measure the reflectivity off of people as you shine an infrared light off the people, bounces off, and you can kind of get an idea of where, where someone is gazing. Um, so you get, you know, a real-time record of where people are looking. Um, when we record both, you know, eye movements and fixations, eye movements are called saccades. Um, fixations, you know, when the eyes stop moving or its eyes always really moving, but um, when the eye kind of centers on something um, for a little while, and you, that's kind of like it uses an index of processing. You're so, um, let's see, and I guess it's just a, a fun fact is so when your eye is actually moving, when you're saccading, um, visual input to the brain is suppressed. And so since we're making eye movements for about two and a half hours per day, you're effectively blind uh, about two and a half hours per day, and we don't realize it. Um, just kind of something to, to keep in mind. So if you think about displays where you update the display um, when the eyes are moving, you could do whatever you wanted, and people wouldn't detect it until um, they stop moving. And so it's just there's a lot of potential use there, at least in terms of you know, in introducing surprising elements into the display when eyes are moving. Um, we're a ways away from that. But again, trying to think about what could be possible in the future. So here's an actual, I'll just show you guys a, a quick video of, you know, um, eye tracking. This is Portal 2, so if you don't want to, um, any spoilers or see any levels in Portal 2, you can look away. I'll let you know when the video is over. Um, but yeah, just a quick video of kind of like, you know, someone playing Portal 2 and kind of visually consuming a map. And so the, uh, um, you know, the, the red circles are fixations. The size of the circle is proportional to the length of time spent fixating. So when the eyes have stopped moving. And then the, uh, the lines connecting the circles are the, uh, the saccades, the eye movements. Yeah, and so we actually, um, again, the focus of this talk is not really on playtesting, but we do use these a lot in playtesting in terms of, you know, determining how people are, are consuming our levels. You know, um, you can actually do, and I had to cut these slides, unfortunately, you could actually do um, quantification of, of eye movements and determine kind of what cognitive mode people are in. Like, there's, there's different patterns of eye movements that correspond to, you know, maybe scanning the display, just, you know, visually consuming it versus searching for a particular item versus problem solving. You can actually quantify these based on, like, the trajectory in, of the eye movements and the length, of, I guess, the length and number of fixations. And so, we, you know, we, we, we'd like to think about that in the future in terms of, like, when we're playtesting our games. It's like, okay, well, like, you know, we can tell what people are doing at any given point in time. And so you get rudimentary insight into cognition just from where people's attention is landing, um, or at least where they're looking, um, which we think is pretty powerful. Powerful. So pros and cons of eye movements, um, it's an index of attention, right? So it's not, you know, as tied to emotion as some of the other, um, I guess, some of the other um, physiological signals. But again, um, you know, it's still pretty useful. Um, and as I mentioned, it could be a rudimentary index of thought. And if you couple this with pupil dilation, um, which is, you know, a great correlate of arousal, you can get arousal as well. And so I'll pretty much any eye tracker you buy will be able to measure pupil dilation. Um, you know, it's a, a unique metric and very, very reliable eye tracking technique is, is kind of mature now. It's still very expensive, um, but the technology is mature, so you get pretty good and pretty robust measurements of, of visual attention. Um, the cons, it's incredibly expensive, the most expensive, probably the most expensive um, of all the signals at the moment. Um, you know, talking, I'm talking in the tens of, of thousands of dollars for an eye tracker. Um, there are companies that are trying to bring that down by an order of magnitude, um, you know, in the five grand range. Um, and then they're actually, I know there's an open source project um, where people are trying to do this with webcams. Um, I don't think it's there yet, um, but again, it's nice that people are trying to kind of bring this technology down to, you know, consumer price points. Um, so just something to think about. Um, you know, other cons, it, you know, definitely requires a lot of analysis, you know, postdoc analysis. Um, you know, you can automate stuff and you can write scripts, um, but if you want to tag various features in the display, it can require a lot of analysis then to kind of do kind of the, at least the, the quantification of scan pattern that I was talking about. Um, that requires a lot of work as well. So you can get great data out of it, but you have to work for it. 
Um, and then just one, you know, fact to it is that, you know, it, it can be intrusive as well. Um, like, you know, they've done studies where you, you um, tell people you're, you're tracking their eyes you tell, and, or you don't, and the people who know their eyes are being tracked, you know, have different eye movements. Like, they're, they're more deliberate um, in their eye movements. So, you, so, again, as with any kind of measurement technique, you know, we're introducing bias um, into the equation, unfortunately. But, um, you know, the, the data for the most part is pretty clean, but I, I didn't want to, like, let you guys um, think that it was completely bias-free. Um, all right, so... Uh, last one to talk about is EEGs. Um, so this is measuring electrical potentials of the brain. Um, EEGs are primarily time-based signals, so finding out when an event occurs. Um, but you know you can put sensors all over the head, and you get coarse measures of location, um, which is pretty cool. And um, I guess what they're primarily used for, at least in terms of like their immediate applicability, is you can look at the frequency spectra, like, so the frequency kind of bands of, of electrical potential in the brain. Um, and, and the latency of the spikes. But you, if you deconvolve the frequency spectra, uh, you can get um, measurements of emotion. Like there are alpha waves that are kind of low frequency um, that are correlated with relaxation, and there's beta waves that are correlated with alertness, and there are delta waves that are correlated with kind of like focused attention. Um, so you could get these measurements, and you, you, can, you, know, you can measure engagement in your games, for example, or detect when a player was engaged or detect when a player was relaxed and so forth. Um, just the yeah, upper left picture is, you know, Potential scalp locations like EEG studies and IMA labs, you know, acquire hundreds of electrodes. Um, there are consumer-grade headsets that are a few hundred bucks um, that, that, you know, do a pretty good job of measuring emotion. Um, that, you know, use far less sensors. There's a couple that only have two sensors on the forehead. Um, the, the right graph is just because I, I like, you know, cool-looking graphs, and it's just kind of showing you how, uh, you know, different regions of the brain can light up at various points in time uh, for different stimuli. So EEGs, you know, positives, you know, you, you can get arousal out of them. You can get valence. Um, again, not a complete picture, but you, know, you can do uh, a pretty good job. And you can get rudimentary insight into thought. Um, I do not want you thinking that you can get complex thought um, through, with, through consumer-grade EEGs at the moment. Um, you know, we can do some stuff, but uh, the brain is very, very noisy. And so to actually, you know, extract signal from noise usually requires, you know, hundreds of trials with minimal differences between conditions and so forth. And so you can get localization. You can tell when people might think about a leftward action versus a rightward action or maybe a pushing or pulling action. Um, but, you know, getting, like, you know, we're not, at, we're not close, actually, um, to, you know, playing Halo with your head yet. Uh, maybe in the future, um, but we're not there yet. Um, cons, you know, it's expensive, you know, um, intrusive, you know, uh, so the data, again, is not clean. Um, it can be very noisy and very hard to kind of extract signals sometimes. And then difficult to validate, right? Again, you're, you're relying on someone else's product to kind of validate stuff for you. And again, we, you know, we're, we're trying to kind of come up with our own, our own solutions to this. And so it's a, a, you know, a point I'm, I guess I want to heart. Well, I, I bring up, I guess, just because it's something to think about is that, um, you know, like, there are disagreements about how to kind of quantify, you know, waveforms in the brain or EGs in the brain. And so it's important to realize that, the data, you, you know, the data you're getting is dependent upon one person's interpretation of what's going on, or you know, one company's interpretation of what's going on. Um, other techniques, uh, so you know, we have pupil dilation, um, body temp, body posture. Um, yeah, I'm not really going to talk about them. I will mention that um, people have actually done studies, and so if you couple um, body posture and pupil dilation, so you could do pupil dilation remotely with an eye tracker, you could do body posture remotely with a depth sensing camera like Connect or, or whatnot. Um, you can account for about 80% of self-reported frustration. Um, just to those two metrics, two, you know, non-intrusive metrics. And so not, not too shabby um, in that regard. There's also uh, lots of stuff we haven't thought about, some stuff we have that I guess I'm not talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, you know, a, a partial painting of the picture. There are, you know, many more ways you could be extracting information from the body or from users. And so, you know, these are some of the common ones, some of the most useful ones, but, you know, it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't feel like I'm constraining kind of like the notion about feedback to, to the, the metrics I've mentioned. All right, so let's get to the, the good stuff. Um, so, you know, how can we use this data? Um, you know, we could start with the most basic, right? Like passive viewing of biofeedback data. You know, I show you your arousal in-game, and I'll show you a video of that later on, um, which actually is pretty cool. Um, you can think about modifying game experience based upon, you know, a player's internal state, what a player is feeling at any point in time. Um, you know, I'll, I'll walk you through an experiment we did where we modified the, the director in Left 4 Dead, which is it's an algorithm that kind of controls the gameplay experience in Left 4 Dead, where we added biofeedback to that um, and trying to create a, a better experience. You can think about adapting difficulty in real time. So, you know, if you could detect that a player was frustrated, right, or that a player was feeling challenged or a player was not feeling challenged, right, you could modify the game in real time to adapt to that. Um, you know, it's something to think about. You could think about, you know, detecting when a player was bored and, you know, 
figuring out a way to kind of re-engage them. Um, you know, these sorts of, you know, gameplay techniques, are, which are not possible with current control schemes, you know, could be possible. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that we could definitely do them, but, you know, they could be possible with biofeedback devices. Um, we're really curious about optimal arousal patterns. We wonder if they exist. Like, you know, is there a pattern of arousal um, or a pattern of emotion in-game, you know, while someone's playing a game that will lead to the most enjoyable experience? You know, and again, it probably is not the same for all folks, but um, just, you know, thinking about, you know, what would contribute to an optimal pattern of arousal. And so, like, you know, with these techniques, you could start trying to, like, attack that question and say, yeah, you know, it's, it's um, you know, I, I just have three, you know, silly examples of what the pattern, you know, it's peaks and valleys, or maybe it's steadily increasing, or it has a giant peak and then a valley, and then, you know, tiny peaks, or maybe it's steadily increasing peaks or valleys. Um, who knows? But just trying to figure out and seeing if it's possible to figure out, um, you know, if there is kind of a, a pattern, you know, at least in, you know, various levels or, you know, maybe across specific genres of, you know, that would lead to, you know, to the most enjoyable experience. We think it's an interesting question and, and worth attacking. Uh, more applications. Um, so you can think about actually um, inputting physiological, you're using physiological data as direct inputs to gameplay. Like, you know, just a couple, you know, quick examples, like, you know, tying health to arousal. Like, if you stay calm, uh, your health decreases, you know, gradually. If you get highly aroused, your health ticks down quicker. Um, you can think about in-game prompts that are tied to emotional state. You know, if someone's engaged, you don't want to distract them. You minimize pop-ups, for example. If someone's kind of bored or you could tell that they're wandering around and lost, then you could, you know, kind of um, detect that in theory. Um, and add in prompts to kind of help them out. You can think about NPCs responding dynamically. It's like, hey, Mike, why are you so sad? Um, like, you know, if they've detected that like, I was frowning, right? I mean, you can think about experiences like that where, you know, characters or players in-game are responding to what you're experiencing at any given point in time. You know, it could create a really powerful experience. Um, or you can think about, you know, requiring, you know, subjects to remain, or people, players to remain calm, right? Like, you know, having, you know, or getting really aroused to proceed in-game. You can imagine a lie detection game where at a full year interrogator, you had to maintain a calm or a low level of arousal. And, you know, if you, if you got aroused or you got nervous, um, you know, you'd lose, right? Or, you, or they would detect your lie. Um, so things like that. Um, again, beyond that, you know, there's lots of stuff we're thinking about. Um, so you think about um, actually doing matchmaking based on physiological profiling. So, you know, maybe you don't want to pair, like, a passive player with a really emotional player, right? Maybe that is a worse pairing than, you know, a really bad player with a really good player. Maybe that leads to a worse experience. And so maybe, you know, if we could pair passive players together or emotional players together or easily frustrated players together, um, we could do a better job with matchmaking. You know, who, who, we don't, I'm not saying it's possible. I'm just, well, I'm, I guess it is possible. I'm not saying we can prove it, but I'm saying it's something we're, we're thinking about. We think it might be worthwhile. Um, along with the kind of the passive viewing of, you know, your own behavior in game, you think about, you know, competitive play, you know, people browsing through a list of matches and trying to figure out what match to watch, you know, and, you know, look, watching the arousal patterns of, you know, really skilled players, you know, it could be interesting, it could be a way to kind of filter, um, you know, how you expect at competitive matches, or if you're just watching a competitive match in general and just knowing, you know, if the, you know, the competitors were feeling aroused or scared or whatnot at any given point in time could be pretty interesting. Um, and then, you know, beyond single-player stuff, you know, we could think about ways to, to use this in multiplayer. Like, you know, you could see a spike in your teammate. Um, you may detect when they're in trouble. Um, or, you know, maybe if you want to grief the other team and you can create a spike in arousal, um, you could earn points for listing responses, um, you know, um, I guess in your opponents. Um, and then the final application, um, again, I'm not really going to talk about playtesting. I think I have one slide on it. It could be a whole other talk. Um, and this is more about kind of the, uh, the gameplay side of things. But... Um, you know, we could definitely, there's so much to be gained, you know, in terms of quantifying how a player's feeling. Like, when, you know, in playtesting, we want to know what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how they're doing, or sorry, and how they feel about it. Um, what they're doing is easy, right? The other two are, are subject to noise. Um, and so, you know, if you have kind of, you know, biofeedback stuff um, in there, we could start making better attempts at quantifying emotion and getting a better understanding of, of how people are feeling as they're playing our games. All right. So um, I'll walk you through um, three, actually, main experiments we did. Are, and they're, they're all still ongoing, um, but you know, I'll kind of walk you through uh, what they are and, and what, you know, why we think they're interesting um, in terms of using biofeedback. So the first is, is modifying the director in Left 4 Dead 2. Uh, second is actually using uh, physiological signals as, as direct inputs to gameplay in Aliens form. And then I'll talk about playing Portal 2 with your eyes. Um, so actually using your eyes as, as controllers. Um, and then I'll, I have a couple slides on kind of passive viewing and, and some multiplayer tests we ran where you could view, um, you know, physiological signals of your opponents and your teammates. And then I have one slide on playtesting. So Left 4 Dead. Um, so in Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead 2, um, you know, the player gets a different experience um, each time they play. And the, the way this works is we have a, you know, a, a kind of a system called the director that creates a dynamic experience um, 
you know, th- I guess throughout, I guess throughout gameplay. Um, and what it does is it modifies enemy spawns, where health and weapon are placed, um, which boss monsters occur, and so forth. Um, and it does this based upon an estimated arousal level. So the director has an estimated arousal level in mind, and it says, yeah, they're highly aroused. I'm going to let them, you know, kind of drop down for a little bit and not bug them. Or they're not aroused based on my estimation of it, and I'm going to give them, you know, a, a smoker to attack or a hunter attack, or I'll have a mob spawn and, and go after them. Um, and so what we wanted to know um, was if you, were, you replace this estimated arousal level um, with actual physiological arousal from the player, can you create a more enjoyable experience? Um, and then beyond that, going back to what I was talking about earlier, is can we determine optimal arousal patterns um, in this regard? Um, so really quickly, just going over how the director works, um, you have survivor intensity as a single value. Um, it's increased in response to in-game trauma. So you, you, know, you get attacked, you lose health, um, you, you kill an enemy that's close to you, for example, um, intensity increases. Um, intensity decays to zero over time. I think it's, I don't know, 30 seconds to a minute, depending on uh, Vegas, various factors. And the goal of the director was to create kind of peaks and valleys in this estimated arousal level. Um, so you can look at the, the graph here. The, the middle line is the most important, where it says survive. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was actually just wanting to know, did you use experienced gameplay players for your tests? Yeah, so, um, so it actually varies. Um, so we, we did, for the Left 4 Dead 2 study, we had, these were all um, not Valve employees, but, you know, external play testers, but people who had played Left 4 Dead 2 um, before, who had come into the lab. Um, so, yeah, but the question, you know, what you could do with novel gameplay players, and are those patterns of arousal going to be different? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Hi. I actually uh, work on a very similar problems with eye tracking. Uh, with our play testing, uh, we've actually found that uh, that when people have to focus on the screen for a long period of time, they start to get headaches, and we get problems with eye strain after a long, like more than 15 minutes of gameplay. Okay. So I'm kind of curious if you uh, tested beyond 15 minutes, or yep. uh, what kind of problems you may have run into. So the question was. Um I guess the, um, it's whether or not we can use eye trackers for longer than 15 minutes because um, there is potential for eye strain. Um, yeah, so we've tested people for an hour and a half. Um, you know, people can the, the eye tracker we use is pretty robust, so people can look away from the screen. Um, you know, they can they can stand up and sit down um, if they want. So we've had you know hour and a half long, two hour play testing sessions, and, and haven't had really any complaints of eye strain. Um, you know, we kind of you know we have I guess the. The, the, you know, the, the bounding box in terms of what the eye tracker can attack lets you kind of move your head around. You don't need to stay in the same position. Um, so we've been okay in that regard. Okay. Can you, for, uh, can you force uh, arousal in the human player by giving them signals that their in-game character is getting highly aroused? Like if, I don't know, if the characters left for dead start breathing heavily or their vision gets blurry, will that force arousal in the player? Yeah, so the question was, can you um, kind of induce... Um, arousal or, or various responses in the player by having in-game avatars mimic those same responses. Um, and, and so ab- absolutely, um, you know, we have, there are neurons in the brain called mirror neurons that kind of fire when, um, you know, you, you see an action being performed. And so you actually, it actually like is kind of analogous to you performing the action yourself. If I see someone swinging a baseball bat, the same neurons that would, would fire when I was swinging a baseball bat fire when I actually see that process occurring. And so you, you get those kinds of triggers where if you see, you know, an in-game, you know, your in-game avatar, you know, panting heavily, for example, um, absolutely would you see a change um, in respiration rate. I um, mean, it may not be, you know, it may not be a large change, but absolutely will we'll, we'll players kind of be affected by what they see on screen. Hey, so the alien swarm testers, how did that work out for them? The which one, sorry? The alien swarm testers? Yeah. Did they actually succeed? Yes. So the question was, did the alien swarm play testers actually succeed? And yeah, um, so I, I showed, you know, a small snippet just because I was pressed for time. But yeah, the alien swarm... Um, yeah, so I think uh, about 60% of people made it through. And again, this is our algorithm, right? So we're tweaking it so we can make it harder or easier. Um, but yeah, about 60% of people made it through so far. So did they have access? Did they see the uh, time left? And did they see the color change as well? Yeah, so, in th- so we, we've, we've done it both ways. We have, they always see the time left. They always see the, the color shift from green to yellow to red or, or back or whatever. Um, we've done studies where we show them the arousal and not. Um, when we showed them the arousal, they got more frustrated because they didn't understand why the timer was speeding up sometimes. And um, when they didn't see the arousal, they were more likely to kind of be cool with it. OK, cool. Thanks. I was wondering if you were able to track uh, flow and mastery from uh, players. I mean, if you a master player, it would be calm during the gameplay, or and if you were able to design for a flow, uh, you know, uh, experience. 
Okay. So the question was, and did we did we track flow and kind of you know mastery you know mastery players or players who are really good or experts at the game? You know, did we look at you know kind of differences between them? And I, I'm assuming kind of you know people who are who are not masters or novices or whatnot. Um, we, we've done some kind of comparisons of, of novices and experts. We haven't tracked flow. Um, you know that that can be a little tricky to operationalize sometimes. Um, but you know we haven't done anything systematic in that regard. We are really curious in, in Nobert expert differences and how that correlates to patterns of arousal, or patterns of physiological signal. Um, but I guess it's stuff I, I haven't. I guess I didn't plan to talk about and can't really talk about at the present time. Okay. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Thank you guys very much. Oh, sorry. I guess one more question. Hi. Um, I teach. At Arizona State University, I'm game design, but I'm doing a collaboration with BioDesign, and I was wondering if you would be interested in working, perhaps, with people who are doing like physical probes into the body, and perhaps expand your research that way and work with academia. Or are you all commercially like oriented and you want to stay in that world? Oh, so is, is, was like, the question, um, you know, what devices are we using, and are we, are we like? averse to using devices that are actually attached to the body? Is that the question? Sorry? Yeah. I, I can see how our research might complement each other, yeah. um, but I come from academia and there's no like commercial application that we're going for um, other than, well, the biodesign guys are going for um, designing prosthetics. Right. Um, so I was wondering, there's, a, there's, a, there's an intersection there. Would you be interested in perhaps working with us? Oh, sure. I mean, well, Arizona so State. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, of course, yeah, we're definitely interested in, in kind of seeing what other people are doing. I mean, the whole point of this talk was to say, hey, we think this is really cool, and we definitely want to encourage more people to be thinking about, you know, both kind of, you know, how to improve the techniques we have and then how they can be used in gameplay, so both the commercial and kind of, the, you know, the basic and applied, you know, concerns of this research. So definitely we can talk and, and see if we can, you know, okay. see if there's potential down the line for, you know, a collaboration of whatnot. So I'll send you an email? Sure, that's okay. fine. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it.